Tungsten ore is found in many parts of the world. Europe, Africa, Australia, South America, and even the United States. The largest and richest deposits, however, are in communist China. The ore we use has been upgraded at the mine to a concentrate of approximately 70% tungsten oxide. We use only the best grades of ore, those with very low level of impurities, such as molybdenum and phosphorus. This ore was imported from Peru. Approximately 50% of the volume you see as ore will end up as tungsten metal. The first operation is grinding the ore to fine dust. Steel balls in this large mill break up the particles. The pulverized ore is automatically sorted by size so that only the smallest particles move on. The heavier pieces return for further grinding. The fine particles are transferred to a steam-heated pressure vessel where they are mixed with caustic soda, heated and agitated until the chemical reaction is complete. The mixture is then filtered in large drums with porous coatings to remove the solids, which are scraped off and fall into a chute. The liquid sodium tungstate passes through and is pumped to a large cypress tank where it is agitated and calcium chloride is added. A white precipitate of calcium tungstate forms. When the reaction is complete, the agitator is stopped and the precipitate is allowed to settle for 20 hours. The liquid on top is siphoned off, leaving a calcium tungstate slurry which is pumped into a large rubber-lined tank previously filled with hot hydrochloric acid. After the reaction is complete, the tank contains a yellow precipitate which is tungstic acid. The mixture is pumped to the wash house where it is processed in one of the 16 large cypress tanks. The tank is filled with water and the tungstic acid precipitate is allowed to settle for 20 hours. This washing is repeated until tests fail to show any more impurities being removed. The usual time is six days. The washed tungstic acid slurry is pumped into a tank with ammonia. The tungstic acid dissolves to form ammonium tungstate. This liquid is then filtered in the same manner as the sodium tungstate. The ammonium tungstate solution is heated to drive off water and excess ammonia. As a result, crystals of ammonium paratungstate form. The crystals are removed before all the liquid disappears and are washed and dried. Further drying is done in these trays in an oven. The dried crystals are sifted to remove any oversized particles. Crystals are weighed and then stored in drums. These crystals are the basic material for reduction to metal. At this point, samples are taken and tests run for purity and size. While this seems to be a rather involved process of ore purification, each of the steps is designed to remove specific impurities. Further checks will be made throughout the process to ensure high-quality finished products. But now a review of the crystal's test data must be made to schedule the production of the various types of tungsten metal. Undoped metal for the carbide industry, billets for sheet rolling, and various kinds of wire for lamp and electronic applications. Selection of the particular batch to be used for 218 non-sag wire process is based on the purity check. While all the crystals must meet specifications, only the purest available are used for 218. These crystals are partially reduced in the rotary furnace. By varying the feed, temperature, and pressure of the gas inside the furnace, we convert the white crystals to blue, purple, or brown oxide. A 24-hour run is called a batch. To homogenize the batch, the oxide is placed in the Gemco blender. Only blue oxide is used for 218 powder and must meet specific standards of purity and particle size. To obtain the non-sag characteristic for 218 wire, the oxide must be doped. For many years, this was done in large bowls by hand. Today, we have a blender in which the oxide can be thoroughly mixed with potassium, silicon, and aluminum doping agents, and then dried in a vacuum by heat from a steam jacket.
The doped oxide is transferred to a metal hopper. Controlled amounts are automatically weighed and fed into a scoop, which the operator then empties into a boat. When the boats are filled, they are stoked or pushed into a dual tube furnace for final reduction. The operation requires precise controls on boatload quantity, stoking time, hydrogen flow, and temperature to ensure the removal of the proper amount of oxygen from the oxide. Purity, specific particle size, and distribution are other vital factors affecting the quality of the finished product. Boats are removed from the furnace every 18 minutes. The metal powder is sifted to remove agglomerates formed in reduction. The pot placed in rubber buckets and perchloric and hydrofluoric acids to remove any excess dope which may have remained on the surface of the powder after reduction. The acid washing is followed by a thorough water rinse after which the powder must be dried, sifted and blended. After blending, a check on the average particle size is made on the powder. This is another of the many tests made to ensure proper distribution, purity, and ease of packing. Although these tests are passed, the powder lot cannot be released for production until samples have gone through the complete manufacturing process, including the life testing of finished lamps. When the powder lot is released for production, it must again be sifted and tumbled before ingots are pressed. Because tungsten powder will not flow under pressure, it must be placed evenly in the steel mold before pressing begins. The tool is run back and forth to be sure there are no air pockets and to help distribute the powder. After leveling the powder with a gauge, the operator assembles the mold and inserts it into the hydraulic ram press. Actual pressing pressure is 15 tons per square inch, or 2250 on the gauge. Pressing pressure is controlled to produce uniform ingots. The mold is disassembled, cleaned, and coated with mineral oil to prepare it for the next ingot. Note the care that is used throughout the entire pressing cycle. The molybdenum slab is used to support the ingot because it lacks sufficient strength. In addition, the ingot is pre-centered in a furnace with a hydrogen atmosphere. After two hours at 1200 degrees centigrade, the ingots are strong enough to be handled as long as reasonable care is used. However, the surface can still be easily scratched and the ingot does not have enough cohesiveness to be worked. It must therefore be treated by heating it to over 3,000 degrees centigrade. Since most materials used for enclosures would melt, we pass electricity through the ingot in a hydrogen atmosphere inside a water-jacketed copper bottle. Treating for approximately 50 minutes results in an ingot density of 17.3 grams per cubic centimeter. Control of time and temperature are most important in this operation. These ingots are now ready to be worked. If one of them were to be drawn to the end of our normal die line, it would yield about 800 miles of wire. The first operation is rolling to attain the size and physical characteristics desired. 
Because the ingot is brittle at room temperature, it is rolled hot. Although the ingot is heated above 1,000 degrees centigrade, the rolling operation is called cold working. Because the heat is kept below the recrystallization temperature. Note that the operator always checks temperature with a parameter before pulling the ingots from the furnace. When the ingots are heated to approximately 1500 degrees centigrade, rolling can begin. At several points in the rolling process, we recrystallize the rods to remove the cold work and control the grain size. As the ingots are rolled, they increase in length and reduce in cross-section. Several different passes will be made through the mill until the ingot now essentially a square rod, will become round in cross-section. When the rod is about three-eighths of an inch in diameter, it is swaged on the number four roll feed machine. The end is preheated before it is pushed through the swaging die. The rod is heated in the furnace to about 1400 degrees centigrade then enters the die and is swaged to size. Power-driven rolls continue to pull it through the die and onto a trough. The process is continued on other swaging machines until the rod is approximately one-eighth of an inch in diameter. Before we can begin wire drawing, the next major step in the process, we must point the end of the rod so it can be inserted into the die. This is done in molten potassium nitrate, which reacts violently with tungsten. Note the pointed end. Drawing is the process of pulling the heated rod through a die slightly smaller than the rod. First, it passes through a graphite lubricant, which reduces dye wear and also protects the wire from excessive oxidation. It then continues through a burner, which bakes on the lubricant and brings the wire to the proper temperature so it can be pulled through a die, which reduces the wire diameter and increases its length. By special lighting, we can see this dramatic reduction in size. This machine, number 474, is one of 600 drawing machines required to supply tungsten wire demand. All the machines are designed around the basic components for wire drawing equipment. An unwinder, a lubricator, a burner, a die, and a take-up container. There may be over 50 drawing passes on a variety of machines for orders of small size wire. Although wire may be drawn with either diamond or carbide dies, diamond dies are used for wire sizes below 10 mil. This advanced model DR number one is a prototype of drawing equipment in the near future. It is a good example of progress being made in design. At various points in the drawing lines, we anneal the wire to remove the stresses and strains developed in drawing. This is done by heating the wire in a hydrogen-filled box. This machine draws wires so fine that it must be observed by reflected light. It's an art to thread and start these machines. Counters used to measure point wire length in meters are virtually friction-free. Rating or measuring wire size cannot be done accurately by measuring wire diameter. Instead, we cut a 200 millimeter length and weigh it on an extremely accurate analytical balance. This is done throughout the process to ensure optimum drafts as well as to classify finished wire. For applications requiring wire smaller than the end of our normal drawing line, we use an electrolytic etching process. We have made wire as small as 50 millionths of an inch in diameter. This same process, slightly modified, is used for removing the lubricant for clean wire applications. If annealed wire is desired, we apply heat and tension in a hydrogen atmosphere and make annealed wire, which is also cleaned and straightened, in one pass. 
In other cases where clean wire is required, it must be processed chemically in hot caustic. Where straightened wire only is needed, we use heat and tension. Still other customers ask for fabricated parts, and this machine, with the cage open for a better view, makes stranded wire for use in the vacuum metalizing industry. The Torrington coiler forms stranded wire used for making TV tubes, automobile headlamps, and toys. Our fabrication unit has produced a variety of products from lamp filament supports to x-ray targets. In order to service our customers promptly, we stock many wire sizes and finishes. These panels hold 720 spools on each side. Our normal finished inventory is 450 million feet of wire. The sales value is one and one half million dollars. To operate a business of this size successfully, we must have the buildings and the specialized equipment, but most of all we value the countless skills and abilities of nearly 1,000 dedicated people through all phases of manufacture. The preparation of the ore. The processing to crystals. The reduction to metal powder. The pressing into ingots. The rolling into rod. And the drawing to wire. Over the years, billions of meters of high-quality tungsten wire with hundreds of applications have been developed and produced at the Cleveland Wire Plant. We are proud of our past and look forward to our future, serving the ever-growing needs of the lamp and electronics industries.